for the body and how you and I get to receive his grace and his love and his forgiveness. And then together, as believers, we get to share that with our fellow believers and also those that still need to know him. So I would encourage you to get the elements ready as we take them together and remind you on that night, the night that Jesus was about to betray, that he gathered around the table a community with his disciples. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me, church. Let's remember what he did for us in the breaking of his body.
this morning. And my prayer is always that Holy Spirit would speak to you individually as we meet together as a body on Sunday mornings. And this weekend is an exciting weekend at Christ Fellowship. Although I'm pretty sure that every weekend at Christ Fellowship is exciting. But this one particularly, I have some class for that. This one particular is our Connect Weekend.
our gifts this morning, whether it's out of abundance or lacking, you would bless it. That you would use it through our church to bring the hope and the message of Jesus Christ to South Florida and beyond. God, we are grateful and expectant for what you're going to do with the gifts this morning. And we ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. Oh, sorry, folks. You can go ahead and begin passing the buckets. And as we get ready to jump into the message this morning with Pastor Julie bringing the word, I want to highlight something real quick for the ladies. Where are the ladies? Oh, I knew I'd hear you. That's awesome. You all received something on the way in. And guys, I don't know if they gave one to you, but you can take one on the way out because I'm sure you have a wife or a sister or a niece Ooh. or a cousin, right? That you can invite to our sisterhood event of the year. Amazing. Amazing is happening next month. I can't believe it's already here. It's going to be right around the corner at our garden's location. You have three opportunities, the 26th, the 27th, or the 28th. I will be at all three, so I will see you at one of the three. If you want to come to all three with me, I'd love that too, but I want to encourage you ladies. This isn't something to just put on your calendars. It isn't just another to do, but it's actually going to be a place and a space where you're going to encounter the spirit of the living God with women from all backgrounds of life, different places in their journey, and you're going to experience worship, word, and we also like to have fun. And we're going to do some celebrating of what God's doing in our lives as well. So make sure to text info to 441 441 or scan the QR code on the invite. But hey, I, I think, I don't know if I if convinced you, maybe, some of you, I don't know, maybe this will help. So hey, I can't wait to see you. Amazing girl, take on. Just as nature reflects the heart of its creator, we are reflections of the beauty, the strength and the attention of his works. And since we know God has made every season to house his nature, our lives are living testimonies of this truth of the ages. In seasons of newness, of unearthly potential, of restarting from the ground up, there's flourishing for you. And, um, and I, it's going to be a little bit personal. 
I'm going to take a risk and be a little bit um, vulnerable today. And I'm going to start out today by, by sharing something with you that I am not really proud of. Something about myself that I'm not really proud of. And, and that is that, that I can be really clueless. And there are some people, some friends on the front row here that usually like shout me down. They're really quiet right now, so they don't want to say anything. Julie's clueless. But I, I can be really clueless. I know um, that, that the truest thing about me is what God says about me. He says that I am called and chosen. He says that I am confident. That I can do all things through Christ. And that is, that, that this is who I am in Christ. But it is not who I am. And I'm left up to my own devices, right? I have lots of stories. I want to share one of them with you. Um, see, I, I've had my car for about eight years now, right? And, and you guys know if you've had your car for a while, over time they start to develop these character flaws. And I call them character flaws because they usually show up after the warranty expires, right? And so my my car, you know, has a couple character flaws. Maybe it says to you, you know, it's the window that no longer rolls down, right? It's a cigarette lighter that doesn't charge your phone. I'm not sure if it ever did in the first place, but but for me, um, my, my car started to develop this flaw a couple years back. Um, when this light, this random light came on in my car, right? And so I'm driving down the road, and this random light shows up in my car, and, and it says to check my tire pressure. And so the first time it showed up, I'm like, I'm pulling over to the side of the road. As soon as I can, I get out, I check my tire, it looks okay. Um, but then I, I go home, I'm like, Todd, can you check tire pressure? Can you check my tire pressure? He says, it's fine, but I'm not going to take any chances. So I take it into the dealership, and, and they, they take a look at it, and they say, hey, listen, it's not your tire, it's your computer. It's a computer glitch. Well, that's a lot more expensive than a tire, right? But, you know, so yeah, please fix it. So over time, you know, it's fixed, and then it shows up again. So the next time it shows up, you know, I go check my tire, and it's fine, and, and I, I say to wait until the next time I need to set my car in the shop to get it fixed. And, and over time, this has happened several times, and I always do check my tire, but, you know, it's a little bit, okay, yeah. Um, so over time, I get used to it. So a couple weeks ago, this light comes on again, and, um, and so I'm driving home from church one night, and I, 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 I'm about, I'm about five minutes away, and so the light comes on, I get out of the car, and I get home, check the tire, it's fine, as usual. And so the next morning, I come back to the church, um, early in the morning, and I get up to my office, and within about three minutes, I get this text with this photo. I think you probably saw this coming. Yes, this was my, my flat tire. I had a flat tire. I, could ride, I, I drove the entire way to church on a flat tire. I drive on I-95 every single day. This could have been catastrophic. I could have died, right? All because I was a little bit clueless. But here's what I want you to know. Is that today, in this room, there are many of us that, that we have a morning light going on on the inside of us. And over time, you've just gotten kind of used to it. Um, you, you kind of start ignoring it because it might be a little bit too costly. It might be complicated to fix like my computer. Or maybe... You've tried to fix it many times, and it just keeps coming back. And what you don't know is that, that you are actually driving around on a flat tire, and you are headed for some danger. See, the, the, the signal that I'm talking about, the warning light that I'm talking about today, is, is something so serious that the Surgeon General actually issued a warning. And this, they said this is the number one threat to America, to America's well-being, their emotional well-being, and their physical well-being. That, that this, this warning is actually more dangerous than diabetes, obesity, and smoking 15 cigarettes a day. What I'm talking about today is loneliness. Loneliness. Loneliness, by definition, is this, is this ongoing psychological state when we lack the consistent authentic relationships that we need to thrive. We need relationships to thrive. And this has become, loneliness has become this pandemic. And pan means that everyone's affected by it, right? And for the first time in history, every generation is more lonely than the generation before them. And in an anonymous survey, and I say anonymous for a reason, because in an anonymous survey, two-thirds, 65% of people admitted that they were lonely. But only 12% will talk about it or do anything about it because there's such shame and embarrassment attached to it. And so I'm not going to ask you today to raise your hands and stand up if you're lonely, but, but I am going to ask you for participation, okay? So this is a participation moment for all of our campuses. I, I want to ask you if your birthday is between the months of January, February, March, April, May, June, July, and August, I want you to stand to your feet. Stand your feet January through August, if that's when your birthday is. Okay, stand your feet. Okay, so I, I want you to look around for a minute. This is how many people are at your work 
because, because you're unworthy or, 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 or unwanted. If you're a student, you're not lonely because you're uncool or, or un, unpopular. See, this, you're not, this morning, it is not, don't sit down yet. Morning is not. <laughs>
You'd rather post your tough times on social media than risk someone coming over to have that deep conversation. You feel like you're always the one who initiates getting together and you just can't handle another no, so you just don't bother. Or someone does initiate, they call you to make last minute plans, but it's just easier to get cozy and binge on Netflix. Or maybe it's bigger, maybe you're the one that's helping everybody else find their relationships, but you're missing yours. What I want you to know is this isn't a random list. This is actually my list. A few years back, after just everything went through in 2020, like there was just this underlying sadness that I had gotten used to. And my perspective on a few things was just a little bit off, right? I was a little clueless. But here's the deal, this is not how you were created to live. This is not how I was created to live. Loneliness, loneliness isn't, it wasn't the problem, it was actually the signal. And loneliness is this warning light that's going on, right? This is warning light that's going on inside of us to let us know that one of our deepest human needs is not being met. And that we're missing out on one of God's greatest gifts, the part of his inheritance that he wants us to experience. See, loneliness isn't what's wrong with you, it's what's right with you. It's not what's wrong with you, it's what's right. Your signal's working. Your signal's working, and, and it, what's right with you is that you were created in the image of a relational God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, for a relationship. And so Jesus, actually when he came to the earth, he modeled this for us. He modeled this, he lived every single day in community. He had, he had this crowd that, that he lived with, that traveled with him, and there were a lot of people in that crowd. But then, in that, in that crowd, there was also this, this community of 72 disciples. I know we talk about the 12 all the time, but there were actually 72 disciples. And these are the people that they did life with about every single day. But then from that community, there were, there were 12 close friends. The 12, we, we know their names. And, and even in the 12, there were still three really close friends that got to do the cool stuff. Like, they got to go to the Mount of Transfiguration and see Elijah and Moses. And I bet you, like, other disciples were like, hey, can I go something else? Taking these guys with me. Peter, James, and John. But they were also the guys that were the darkest night of his life, the night before he was crucified. That, that he asked those, those three to, to stay close, within earshot, just to pray with him. See, if the Son of God needed these kinds of relationships, it would be really arrogant of us to think that we don't. See, the, the call to discipleship, when, when Jesus said, come follow me, he was calling us into community. That's what it says in John 16, I'm sorry, John 13, 34. It says this, this is the kind of community he's talking about. So now I'm giving you a new commandment that you love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. He's saying that, that this kind of love is what's going to make your, 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 your faith actually believable and contagious. And what he's saying here is that, that this kind of love, it, it can't be done at a distance. And this kind of love is just a feeling we have. It's actually this commitment that we make. The kind of love that, that Jesus is talking about here is this Galatians 6 2 kind of love. That when life is unbearable, the breakup that you didn't see coming, the, 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 the heartbreak, the, the devastating doctor's report, that you would have people to help carry the weight. Because all of us are going to go through things that are too heavy for us to carry, and it's God's plan that you wouldn't have to carry it alone. This is a, a 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 kind of love that when life knocks you down, that you have your people to encourage, to give you courage, to get back up, to remind you that God is for you and there's greatness in you and that you would be there to do the same for them. But it's also, it's also a Proverbs 27, 17 kind of love, an iron sharpening iron kind of love, that and being sharpened does not always feel so good, but you're going to stick around for the hard conversations. You're going to stick around to be held accountable for the commitments that you made because you know that that is what's going to grow you and make you more like Jesus. It's a Colossians 13, 3, 13 kind of love that you have people in your life that are not surprised by your faults and you're not surprised, they're, and you're not surprised by theirs and you're willing to fight for the relationship by forgiving. And 
I know you're probably sitting there saying, is this kind of community really even possible in 2024? I mean, are, are these kinds of relationships even possible? And I would say to you, yes, but not inevitable. See, I, uh, is it possible? Like, do I have to like, build a front porch on my house or, or move to Uganda? No, but you might have to do something that may feel a little bit countercultural. You know, Todd shared a, um, a, a true story last week. And it's about Ali Afan. And he lived in India. And you remember the story if you were here that he lived in India and he had everything he really needed. He wasn't rich, but, but he was content. He had everything he needed, beautiful family, a thriving farm. But a priest came one day and said that there are people that are getting wealthy in other parts of the world because they are finding diamonds in Africa. And so Ali ends up selling everything that he has, leaving his family behind, going to East Africa to mine for diamonds. And he didn't find any diamonds there, so he followed the crowd to, to Europe. And he didn't find any diamonds there, and finally, penniless and alone and devastated, he ends up taking his own life. Well, meanwhile, back at the ranch, the person that bought his farm actually was in, he was in his dream one day, and, um, and he actually came across this rock, and it was kind of sparkly. And so he brought it in his house, and he put it on a mantle, and the same priest came and made, and, and, and made a visit to this guy. And he said, hey, that rock. And he said, yeah, I thought it was kind of pretty. He said, those are diamonds. So you have on the, on the same land that Afad, Ali Afad had sold were acres of diamonds. They actually became the Wakanda diamond mines that are the most exclusive diamond mines on the planet. And he missed it on the same, in the same place, in the same field. And, and Todd asked this question. He said, what if the light you're trying to find is closer than you think. See, when it comes to the opportunity and of this wealth and the richness of these relationships, if you are sitting here today, you are sitting on acres and acres of diamonds. See, in the same way that, that Jesus, Jesus had people. You have people. You're sitting on, on potential wealth and you might be missing it. Because if you only show up like once a month, you, you might miss the diamonds. And I'm not, that's not to judge you, it's just to say, I don't want you to miss out. If you leave, if you, if you come in after the first song and, and you leave during closing prayer, you might miss some diamonds. But there's so much available to you in community. And just like Jesus had a crowd, you have a crowd. You know, there's this crowd that you have in your life. These are the people that you work with, that you go to school with, that you play golf with. That, um, that you're just, you, your kids play travel soccer together. And these are some people that you're doing your life and you see them frequently during the week. And some of you, you may be blessed. You may, have, you may say, I'm not lonely. I have found a few really good friends here. And, and I believe that it is possible to find some, some of those kinds of friends in the crowd. But some of you, um, you might have found a few friends, but you know that you might need a mentor or someone that's going to help you grow in your face so your circle's not quite complete. But for most of us in this room, 65%, according to research, we, we've been, we have a crowd in our lives, like we have a really full calendar, but we are empty in relationships because we're trying to find those close friends out of the crowd. And many times we're stepping over the acres of diamonds that are available to us. And what, what I'm talking about is that this community, we go from the crowd, to get close friends and we skip over the community. And particularly is the faith community that, that I'm talking about. See, just like Avad left his diamonds, there are acres and acres of diamonds right under your feet called the church. And I, I just want you to look at this verse for a minute because I love it. Because this is God's design. It says this. It says, Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God, whose dwelling place is holy. God's places the lonely in families. He sets prisoners free. He gives them joy. His dwelling place is the place where his presence and his people are. And I am not saying that this is the only place that you can find these kinds of friendships. I'm just saying that there could be an incredible amount of wealth that you might be missing out on. And, and I know this. I'm passionate about this because, because this has been so true in my life. You might be going, Julie, you know, you're kind of like the Ugandans because you're a pastor, 
So you do life with a lot of pastors, and you've got an incredible family. And there are people, my family and pastors in this church are part of our, our close circle of friends. But I want to tell you about some diamonds in my life that are not pastors, and they're not part of my biological family. But they've had a profound impact. I want to tell you a little bit about David and Marla. And David and Marla, um, they were and they still are business people, business owners. And, and we met several years ago because we were in a group together. Um, they were a part of our worship team. And we were like a legit group. We did Bible studies. We, we served together. And David was um, one of the was a pianist here, one of the first pianists at our church. And, and we bonded because we're both going through an infertility um, journey. And David and Marla, they adopted two beautiful girls. And this picture is the day that we brought Jefferson home from the hospital. Right? And so they were there. And our friendship grew over time. And, um, and over time, they were actually, the, they looked about an hour away. But they were actually the, the first people that I ever heard that will be telling you guys a lot that you become the average of your five closest friends. Well, David and Ronald took this really seriously. And they wanted to make sure that there was, they had five people, they lived close and did life with them. So they actually moved. They decided to move to this area. And they decided for some reason that they wanted us to be one of those five. And so they decided that they were going to buy the lot next door to us and build their house there. I wasn't sure how I felt about that, right? <laughs> Not because of them, but because of me. I was a young pastor's wife. I felt like I already lived in the fishbowl. Like, what if they see my flaws and my faults? What if I let them down? Well, the plan went forward because I was too insecure to even talk about it. And so they decided, and they said, hey, we're going to build our garage. So it's basically your garage. And so every single day when we come in or leave, we're going to say hi to each other and we're going to like, be able to connect and like, great. Well, listen, I am so glad that David and Marla did not prioritize privacy over community. Because the white fence between our house over the last 25 years has been, I mean, there have been countless numbers of cups of sugar, flour, whatever else we forgot at the grocery store to complete the dessert. The dessert that you had to share if, if we gave you the cup of sugar, right? There was also the place of 10 minute breaks, 10 o'clock at night when our kids were driving us crazy, and we could meet at the fence and have a moment of peace together. It was also, um, it, it was also where there were times that, um, that when, when we, we were praying together, and for our kids, for God to do the miraculous, and, and we saw answered prayers, but then the times that we prayed so hard and didn't get the answer that we wanted, and for some reason it just made it more bearable, knowing that somebody else was there with us and, and that they cared, and, and for some reason our faith kind of grew stronger through it. When Marla in her 20s lost both of her brothers, tragically, in their early 30s, Todd became a brother to David and to Marla. And over time, yes, they can see some of my faults. But they haven't moved. So I think they still like me. You know, so, so this, this relationship has marked our life. But I've got other diamonds I want to share with you. And, and the first one, the next one is, is when you look at this picture, you might see a random wedding photo. This was back in 2020, the day Jefferson and Cassie got married. And, and I see diamonds, like a field of diamonds. And if you look at the bridesmaid right there, that's Lindsay. And Lindsay was volunteering our children's ministry when she was in high school. And, and I was going through a really hard time um, with Jefferson at that time, just needed a little break. And she came and said, hey, can I come over and babysit for free? And I'm like, absolutely. Well, over time, she became such a big part of her life. I did eventually start paying her. Um, but she was a babysitter. Then in college, she became a big sister to Jefferson. I was an answer to prayer because he was an only child. She became a little sister to me. But she had a front row seat of a lot of my parenting mistakes. Now she's a parent. I hope that there's some mistakes that she doesn't have to make because she saw all of mine up close and personal. And next to her is Danny. If you're at a Jupiter campus, you know who Danny is. He's, your, he's on the platform almost every week. He's our, our, our keyboard player there. And Danny, um, when he was in his early 20s, he started a, a music studio called Zeta Studios. And Jefferson was one of his first students. Was this Jefferson when he was 12? I mean, he was in such a dark place, physically and emotionally. And Danny, like, was teaching him how to play guitar. And this is before Jefferson had ever stepped on a platform to lead worship. And the words that Danny spoke over Jefferson's life in these moments have marked him, have changed his, 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 it changed his future. He said, Jefferson, before he ever played on the platform, you are a worship leader. And Jefferson spent the next several years stepping into those words. And now he leads worship. And this is the deal. By the way, um, Danny was raised in our, our church. He's got six siblings, and his mom and dad were plugged in. And, and I didn't have to go Google someone 
to prophesy over my son's potential. He was in my field. He was in my field. And there's so many people in this picture, this wedding photo, um, that you've got Bill, who's been a pastor with us for several years, and his kids. And, and look, there's David and Marla. They were there on the day we brought them from the hospital. They were there, there on the wedding day. They, they have been diamonds in my life. And I know this is my story, but so many other people's story. I think about Cole and Carissa. Cole and Carissa, they, they are, in their early 20s, they decided to start fostering. And they adopted Nyla, who was now six years old. And, um, and then they decided to take in another little girl, Michaela. And when they got Michaela right out of the, of the NICU. And when they got Michaela, she was detoxing off of drugs. And so she was free for hours on end. And they, they have full-time jobs, and, and they have another child, and they're like, we just don't know if we can do this anymore. And so another, another person in their community stepped up, and they took, they took Michaela for a week. And I don't know what happened at the end of that week, but when she came back, if she was different, or, or Cole and Chris were different, but they knew that, that this was going to be their forever child. And because of that break, because of community, their whole family looks different today. Their whole family, their, their family's future was changed because of somebody that stepped out in the community. They didn't have to, they didn't have to Google anything. They, they, they were right there in their field. And you've probably heard say before to find your people, right? You've heard that, that saying, but I would rather to hear is that the relationships I'm talking about, they, they, they can't be just discovered. Diamonds are found, they're not just found, they're, they're mined for. That you have to mine for them. And sometimes when you're, you're mining for diamonds, they don't look like diamonds at first. This is what they look like. They look like this. And sometimes you have to dig through some dirt to find the diamonds. To get to the diamond in relationship, you're going to have to dig through some dirt. And some of the dirt I'm talking about might be the dirt of disappointment or discomfort. And I, re I remember um, a couple years back when when I was telling you about the little season I was walking through, right in the middle of that season, we were gathered together with some of our friends, and, and we had one of those questions in our group that, that we have sometimes. It's like, um, you know, what, what are your highs and your lows? And so I was getting ready to share something, like, really surfacey, okay? Because that's where I got. I was like, yeah, I'm just going to stay on the surface here. And Todd, he just he just kicks the door open, right? And he, like, he like gets all authentic, and vulnerable, and, and, and he starts to tell the group, he's like, guys, it's been a lonely couple of years, and we really need you guys. And I was like, I was a little uncomfortable with that level of vulnerability. But let me just tell you, it opened the door, and everyone around the table started to say, yeah, we're going through some things with our, with our adult kids that we just haven't been able to share. And somebody else said, you know, we want some physically, and, and I just can't burden you guys. And I was like, I know, you know, we also, we know we're really busy, we really need each other. And the crazy thing was, is in that season, Todd and I would like, we'd put out the invite, and, and we'd get rejected, you know, we're like, oh man, they don't want to be with us, oh, you know, here we go again. And we just kind of got tired of it. What we realized was that everyone in the group kind of felt the same way. They all felt like they were the ones making the first move. And here's what I learned in that conversation, is that there, if, if you're going to have these kinds of relationships, you're going to have to press past some disappointment and discomfort. You're going to have to be the one to do the inviting. I mean, yes, you might get rejected. If someone rejects you, you just be sad for a minute and move on and invite somebody else or invite them again. Because you're never going to have these kinds of relationships if you don't make the first move. And so there's, there's a scripture in Proverbs that kind of says it this way. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Friendly means more than just being nice. It needs to get uncomfortable. It needs to take a risk. And is it risky? Yes. Will you get hurt? Yes. I just shared with you all of the, the good points. You know, I know our friends are built on weddings and, and, and births. But great relationships are built under heat and pressure. That's what diamonds come out, is under the heat and under pressure. And it takes some time, right? You're going to get hurt. Will, will somebody let me down? Yes. And you might let them down. But here's the deal. I get it. Because I know some of you, you have been hurt before. And you've been hurt by Christians before. People that should have done that and been better. And I am so sorry if that happened to you. You, 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 you shared a vulnerability and someone used it against you. You shared a confidence and somebody defeated it. And weaponized it. It's happened to me too. And, 
And when that happens, you start to build up walls. And these, these walls, they keep the hurt and the disappointment out. But the same walls that keep out the bad stuff, they're keeping out the good stuff. They're, they're keeping out the joy of celebration. Walls of life, joy. They're keeping out the freedom that comes in confession. They're keeping out wisdom that you don't have. It's keeping out all the wisdom. We don't want you to miss out on any of the good stuff. We, we want you to experience this full life that Jesus came to give you. It's available, it's possible, but it doesn't just happen. It means that we're going to have to dig through some dirt. And so my challenge for all of us, all of us, is that, that each one of us, that we would start mining. We start mining for the diamonds. That we would start digging to make the effort. And I'm just being really bold. I am asking everybody that calls Christ Fellowship their home to start digging. And this is what I mean. At all of our campuses today, because like, like I said, remember I told you that one of the reasons I didn't fix my life was because it was just a little bit too complicated, it was a computer issue. Well, we don't want this to be complicated for you. We've tried to just make it easy. And, and so this weekend, it's connect weekend. And so this is more than a sermon series. My, my prayer is that this will be the beginning of, of you mining for some diamonds. And so, so at all of our campus locations, we've got, we got people out there to talk to you, have a conversation, but I'm asking everyone to do one of three things. I'm asking you to join a group, start a group, or lead a group. If you've never joined a group before, you're a small group, I'm asking you to, to step out, take the risk, right? And we'll be here, you might be asking, will these be my closest, most intimate friends that I share my deep, dark secrets with? And I'm like, probably not, you know, but maybe, you'll never know unless you try. Because for me, every one of my inner circles today were at one point part of an organized group that I was in for Bible study. And we have so many groups, Bible study groups, and pickleball groups, and soccer groups, and just all kinds of groups for you to step in. And some of you might be saying, well, I tried a group before. And it just, I mean, these were not my people. Do you think that in 30 years I've never been in a weird group? Like, I've been in some weird groups, right? But you have a choice to make. You, you can either, right? You can either join another group, or you can start a group of your own. You've already got some people that you might be serving with, that you're in a relationship with, and you can take it to another level. But, but you can take the risk. And for some of you in this room, the, the, um, the, the one-third that your warning light is not going off right now. Did you look around and see how many other people's warning lights were going off? Did you look around and see how many people don't have the relationships that you have? You're fine. You've got these relationships. You're growing in your faith. Well, how about you help somebody else find your people? How about you help somebody else dig for their diamonds? See, there are people that need what you have. And so maybe it's, it's leaving a table at a parenting class because you've already raised your kids. Or maybe it's, it's leading a, a group to, that are just starting out in their faith. Maybe it's starting a group that just meets once a month just to encourage each other. Whatever it is, I'm just asking everyone to take a step because it's time for all of us to mine for the diamonds, to start digging. So I want to pray for you. Could you just bow your heads? God, I thank you for the truth of your word, that your word brings life and life to the full. Your word tells us that we were created for this kind of community. And so, God, I pray today, I pray that, that those that, that their light is going off, that they would take a step, and those that are not, that they would help somebody else take theirs. God, we know that your word says that, that it is so good and pleasant for us to be in relationship, and it's there that you are commanding a blessing. So I command a blessing on your people today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Right, thank you, Pastor Julie, for a great word, and I love that right after this message, we all have a next step, and she shared those with you, right? Join a group, start a group, lead a group. We've got Pastor Alec, our group's pastor in the back, ready to answer any questions that you may have. We have all of our groups and classes printed out with easy ways to take that next step, so then I encourage you just not to, to bust out of here today, but follow Holy Spirit's prompting, whatever that might be. And hey, don't forget to join us next week. We've got Dr. John Maxwell with us, bringing the words. So we're excited about that. Prayer team, you can go ahead and come on forward. And if you'd like prayer this morning, know that we are here to intercede with you and pray on your behalf or for someone else. So Trinity, I love you guys so much. It's so 
glad that you were here. Love.